Welcome. It's good to see everyone here and people I didn't know were coming. It's a wonderful surprise. Welcome to the screening, the New York screening of our film. Uh, it's the first episode of our film series, Trauma to Triumph, The Rise of the Entrepreneur. And this episode is Survivors of War. It'll be on uh, PBS and the World Channel. And if you want to see, there's another episode. Uh, just go to pbs.org and you'll enter the information and search for it and you'll find where it's airing and what time it's airing. So welcome. First, I want to give you a uh, background on how we got here. But before that, I owe some thank yous and recognition to special people and institutions. Um, first, of course, is the matriarch of the film and of our family and of our company, Nan Klein. Thank you for all that you've done on this. Next is, uh, I didn't see if she's here or not, but Judy Katz. <laughs> yeah, you see here. <laughs> I didn't know we'd have a wild crowd this morning. And uh, Judy was like a partner in putting today together. And more importantly, she introduced us to Sam Solaz and um, family. And she wrote a book with Sam called The Angel of the Ghetto. That's, you'll see, it's, it's an impressive life. In a, in, a, in, a, in a very important one. I want to thank the Solaz family and Rose Solaz in particular. The ma <laughs> oh, this is good. The matriarch of the family and for helping bring this to today together. And the next institution I want to introduce and recognize, uh, when I brought it up to Rose, she, when she said, who else is sponsoring this? Her response was, how do I not know about this organization? And that organization is the Blue Card. And if you don't know about the Blue Card, you need to know about it now. The Blue Card takes care of the neediest of the Holocaust survivors in America, the, 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 the ones that live the lowest level be below the poverty line. And the team is a part of the team is here. And welcome and thank you for making this happen. Uh, <laughs> On the film side, making the film happen, I have to call out Daniel Solnier, who was so instrumental in helping create uh, the program and gave so much of his time and love and passion and skill in making this happen. The, I want to cite Matt Caesar, who I didn't know was coming. He was uh, instrumental as well. He's here in the crowd. And uh, as far as sponsors on the film itself, the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, which is an institute in Kansas City that provides resource, important resource, to the would-be entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs all across the country with a special focus in the heartland. I also want to thank um, Don Pablo Coffee, which makes not only a great coffee, but the owner, founder of Don Pablo, um, Don Burke, has provided microloans throughout Colombia for startup entrepreneurs, and that's the reason he was attracted to this. And then this would not have happened at all without the champion of this whole idea and his organization, Steve Mariotti, who is the founder of NIFTY, the Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship, and, and in, in an organization called Atlas Learning. And I want to thank Ashley and her incredible team here at the Y for being so great with this. So the story goes like this on how we got here. It goes back to the spring of 1976 when Nan and I were dating and seriously dating, knowing something special would happen in the future. And she stops me on the quad in, in uh, Brooklyn College and says, you know, we're, you know, we're going to get married one day. What are you going to do for a living? And, okay, a Jewish girl's going to ask that. And I said, <laughs> I said, well, I'm taking television, radio, I'm, I'm going to be a big producer, a big director. What are you talking She goes, really? And I said, I'm going to prove it to you. So I went on a, a mission to find work, to see that when I graduated in another semester, I would actually find work. Went to employment agencies, nothing happening. I actually called stations in nowhere land, and I found one when in, the, in the Carolinas, that I went down to and they said, well, maybe you're in New York, that's great. We'll get you something, either an intern or minimum wage. And I didn't, I didn't want to do that. And then one night we were in the city with the ABC building and there was a guard, we were going to a film, and there was a guard outside and I went to the ABC. I said to the guard, how do you get inside? 
And he said, well, I've been trying for seven years. And that sparked nowhere compared to the people we're profiling, but my trauma. You see, my father, may his memory be for a blessing, my father um, was a tailor. And when we were very young, my mother brought us to New York City to see him working in a garment uh, factory. And we saw him with his t-shirt, it's a beater or a wife beater, and sweating and behind the cage. And he was a survivor as well. It really shook me in a very bit. It lasted forever. When, he was, when this was all going on with Nan and I, he had just started at the age of 66 his own little manufacturing company. In fact, he called it H&A, Harold and Arthur, me, me and my brother, manufacturing, hoping we would get into it. I wanted nothing to do with it and because of what I saw, and it was traumatic for me. I couldn't sleep. I went into depression. I didn't eat. And at the same time, I was taking a course called Alternative Television, and they introduced portable video, which wasn't in existence then. It was pre-VHS. Anyway, it opened up an idea for us, and I decided, we decided to, the idea was to service retail stores, because nobody knew what video was. It would be a novelty. And we took out a $2,000 loan, and we started what would become Teletime Video. Now, <clears throat> Nan had suffered a traumatic incident as well. She married me. <laughs> and because we were partners, we would have to see each other day and night. We got, we, and that was traumatic for Nan. So she used that as a force also. And she decided, we're going to really grow this business, so Harold will be out all the time, and he'll be on sales calls and productions, and so I won't see him that much. One of those times I was on the road, we were doing a shoot for Estee Lauder in Boston, and some of the people from Estee Lauder, Laura, uh, Andrea, Judy, I know a couple are watching online, Lynn and Lauren, uh, was so responsible for our development and learning so much from them. Um, somebody had told me, when you're in Boston, go see Bernie Goldhirsch of Inc. Magazine. So I was able to set up an appointment. I went to see Bernie. I wanted to sell him on our services. And he commissioned us to do a video on entrepreneurs. Because in 1984, the word entrepreneur doesn't carry the same cachet as it does today. And he said, Madison Avenue, who made the advertising decisions, has no clue about the power of the entrepreneur, the importance of America doesn't have an idea of the importance of that. Let's tell their story. So in the course of doing that story, I was infatuated. We were featured incredible entrepreneurs, infatuated with listening and learning from these people. I called Bernie afterwards. I said, I would buy this. Long story short, the Inc. decided to start a series of business educational videos, how to start and grow your business. And we were awarded the contract, fortunately. And I got to go to Boston a lot. And the development of the contract, the development of the first program, sitting in the, in the uh, conference room at the wharf in Boston. And Bernie comes, how's it going? I said, Bernie, your team is amazing. They got us Henry Block from H&R Block. They got us Tom Monahan from Domino's Pizza, Frank Carney, Ross Perot. He goes, OK. But you don't, you're missing something very, very important. How about the people that were laid off? This is in 19, now it's 1986. America has no idea how important the entrepreneurial spirit will be to it. And these people are terrorized. They don't know what other path they can take. So find somebody that was laid off and started business. And we did. And it was somebody from Ohio Bell that got laid off and started his own little small company and did very well. So in the course of all that, we, it, the videos went really well, and we were just producing, producing, and producing. And in the course of that, we met Steve Mariotti, who I know is watching uh, now. Now, Steve Mariotti, as I told you, is the founder of Nifty. He also experienced, when he first came to New York from Michigan, a traumatic experience. He was mugged by a gang with knives, and he developed his own PTSD, and brilliantly, I believe the therapist said, suggested, go be a teacher in a tough neighborhood. And he was a teacher in a tough neighborhood. He had a tough time communicating with the class until one day, one day 
he was telling the class he had to leave. He had to go buy watches. What do you mean you're buying watches? He said, yeah, I buy watches and sell them. What do you buy them for? I buy them for a dollar. What do you sell them for? I sell them for $3. He got the class's attention. He realized this was a way to connect. Now, you, I'm not going to burden you with the, the statistics, but if you Google it, you'll see how powerful and important entrepreneurial education is. That started a movement. And that movement, Nifty, is an international organization. He has offered, there's, a, there's a Nifty in uh, Tel Aviv as well, which Elizabeth Goldhirsch provided the primary funding for. And to this day, they say in the Talmud that uh, you save one life, you save the world. Um, Steve has graduated 1.2 million students, at-risk youth. So I hope you hear that, Steve. So he, he retired uh, three or four years ago when he approached Nan and I, and he said, I want to do this film. He has this belief that the power of entrepreneurship can lift people out of adversity, out of conflict, out of poverty, and this is what happened. So he helped find the initial funding for this. We went out, Nan found some incredible people to be fe featured. Steve had some people to be featured. And the result is a program that we hope not only gets millions of viewers, which it looks like it will, um, but it makes a difference and instills the importance of entrepreneurship in our young people and people that are facing adversity. And what better time than now coming off of the pandemic? So before I start the film, I always have to bring a little bit of Torah into what I say. So reflecting on Perkea vote, which is the ethics of our fathers, there's a, there's a section, chapter 5, verse 16, that goes into the importance of giving charity. And it's more than just that section. But here they distinguish on the different types of people that give charity and what to look for. So on commenting on that, the Chassam Sofer says, this is just such a great introduction to the film and why we made it, these two next statements. Merely providing for physical necessities is insufficient. They must be provided with a feeling of being a normal, functioning, and giving member of society. And the, as we used to say in Brooklyn, the bada bing, bada boom, <laughs> they don't say that anymore. Um, the Chalak Yaakov, who was a Polish Mexican rabbi that was a Holocaust survivor himself, his comment on the charity is the lowest form of tzedakah, which is charity is to hand it directly to that needy person. The highest form is to provide a job or the ability to start a business. Thereby, the recipient retains self-respect and learns how to pull himself or herself out of poverty. So with having given you that introduction, I want to welcome you again, and I hope you find the film to be moving and meaningful. Thank you. Trauma to Triumph, The Rise of the Entrepreneur, is made possible by The Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation, working so that all people, regardless of their race, gender, or geography, have the opportunity to achieve economic stability, mobility, and prosperity. San Pablo Coffee Growers and Roasters passionately supports the entrepreneurial spirit. Throughout the world, we provide education and microloans to hardworking people with big dreams. We proudly stand behind the inspiration of Trauma to Triumph, The Rise of the Entrepreneur. Atlas Learning and Steve Mariotti, empowering organizations and individuals to raise the capital required to achieve their missions. Throughout the centuries, humanity has uh, been aware that war irrevocably changes people. A victim has been victimized through no fault of his own. It's a mental change, psychological and mental change. And I was with one of the hospital corpsmen, opened it up, and from the floor to the ceiling were body bags. They were all my platoon. 
They load us up on a train. We start asking in Polish where they taken us. So the people have made like this. A physical wound you can deal with. A mental wound is like a knife, it's always cutting. And I said, I leave, I quit. I don't want people to keep bossing me around. There's a point where you sort of say, I am in charge of my life now. You are a victim until there is a change and you become a survivor. Sam has inner power, and I think many survivors of all kinds of traumas try to spend their life undoing. One day he was a victim, the next day he went out and he was a survivor. I was born in a little town outside Bialystok. I was the youngest in the family, and my father was also in the meat business. We used to go to the slaughterhouse with them. That's what I learned from watching and doing it. Whatever I know up till now, I did not learn from the street. I learned it from my father and from my brothers. And I lost them all. I had a brother, he was a singer. When he was singing in a theater, and there used to be chandeliers, the chandeliers was ringing, such a voice he had. I used to love pigeons. I had over 100 pigeons. I had a dog. When the Germans came, they, they shot the dog. When the Germans declared war in 39, and the bombs started coming in like 6 o'clock a.m., and the German border from us was 90 kilometers, like 60 miles, and they were by us in four days. The Germans arrived, they collected from the entire community, and they put them in inside and they closed the doors, the windows. Then they started breaking the top windows and throwing in fire bombs. Anybody stood in the window, they shut them down, they fell back inside. The synagogue was burning for two and a half days and the sky was red like a fire. I knew people were burning inside. Between two and 3,000 people, they lost their lives there. In 41, June the 22nd, on a Saturday night, they attacked Russia. Four, five weeks later, they started making a ghetto. This was the end of it. People lost faith. When I was 13 years old, I was all, all on my own. If you can do something on your own without anybody's help, that's where the power comes from. That's when you switch from a victim to a survivor. It's all new buildings. Everything was chopped down. Right now we near the gate was to enter the ghetto. Gate number one. Right, right over here. It was very difficult to go in and out. I already lost my entire family, so I didn't care. And he avoided capture from the Germans by wearing a Virgin Mary around his neck. He had red hair, and he looked like a typical Jew. The Jewish people outside the ghetto didn't have any rights to walk on the sidewalk. They had to walk in the middle of the street. If you caught them walking on the sidewalk, you got 10 lashes. And I always walked on the sidewalk. I never looked backwards, always forward. If I saw a German standing, I walked straight towards the German without fear. This made me like I'm not guilty of anything. I used to go out, go to Kenishin to the farmers, they knew, used to know me. I used to trade for butter, for bread. That's when he started his 
entrepreneurial career? My business was to get shirts, shoes in exchange for food and bringing in three, four times a day. They used to call me the Malach, the angel, because people were starving from hunger. He supplied food for everybody and he knew what hunger was. And I think he thought that he was never ever gonna let anybody go hungry. And when you see the person never smiled, all of a sudden, his stomach is a little full, and the smile comes out, you smile with them. He eventually started bringing in weapons and gunpowder and grenades. There were spies that were in his town ratting people out. He went out and he purposely got caught. He was brought into a house. They chained him to a wall and started beating him up. And he saw the two spies that were there. And he risked his life to go and, and do that for the greater good of the Jewish people. In 1942, they brought to a camp, an army camp in Bialystok, over 35,000 Jewish people. I was in this camp for 19 days. From this camp, they used to load them on freight cars and take them to Treblinka, to the death camp. And they put four people in a line, and one man fell. So the Germans grabbed me, another guy, and we should pick him up and carry I couldn't carry him, so the Germans hit me with a boat. Mm. So I remind lion. So he walked away and he shot the man. We are in a deep forest, a place where it's taken out the people out of the ghetto. There was no room on the trains and they give them a order, get rid of them, all women. 5,500 of the Bialska Ghetto. So they brought them in to this forest they call Pietrasha because the echo from screaming when people dying, the Germans, the Ukrainians, and Lithuanians, they were afraid for uprising. So they take them deeper so nobody can hear. And after they buried, they throw them in. The rest, they were shooting in the back of their heads, and they buried them too, so no evidence could be proven. This is the, the spot, and this is the 5,500, the last. They load us up on a train, easy, 150 people, like sardines. And when we came to a station, the train slowed it down. I climbed out from the window with one hand, the second hand I reached to the latch. I opened the latch and the people pushed the door. So I jumped and they were shooting a bullet when just the show it made me a hole. But I ran and I had shooting and a lot of people died. I asked my brother to jump with me. I begged them and he did not move, he was with his girlfriend, and I never heard of them. A farmer came to pick her up the fee from the fields, and he punched me with the fork, I was inside sleeping. The guy asked me, what are you doing here? So I said, I jumped from the train from the opposite direction. So he said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm looking for work. They didn't know I was Jewish with the Virgin Mary on my neck. Then they said, what do you know how to do? I said, I know everything. We walked in the field and I showed it to the son. I knew better than he did on this farm. And they liked me like a brother or a son. Better cannot be treated the way they treated me. I made 90 percent the farm grow better than it was before as a kid. I was working on a farm. They had a son. He was involved with the partisans. 
and I was with them every night, seven nights a week. I learned guns, pistols, I learned even how to put together a Molotov cocktail. And this is the forest, the big. We used to escape right into the forest. And over there, with the big rock, was opposite a hole, prepared in case they come to the front, we escaped to the forest. When the bombs from the Russians was pushing the Germans, I didn't say nothing, I just took off. When I came to the United States, the same day I got off on the ship, I find the job in the S for butchers. I raised my hand and I had the job for six and a half years. But he was possibly the finest butcher that New York had seen. He had a reputation of being fast, clean. If, out of anybody, when he worked at high grade, he would be on piecemeal and he would make the most money than anybody else because he was the fastest. Story of him working for the high grade manufacturing nation's Frankfurters. He wanted more of the old world flavoring in there, and then they formulated that, and that became the nation Frankfurter. They hired a man to become a foreman, so I lent him $20. So I said, Can I get my 20 I got to go over to the bank. I got to make a deposit. Just like this, I said to him. So he says to me, it's too bad Hitler didn't come and, and kill the rest of you over here. I said, what did you say? So I grabbed a knife and I ran towards him outside. I said to the cops, I'll kill him. And I went upstairs. And I said, I leave, I quit. The day I quit, the same day I started a business. I'll better make a dollar my own instead of to go for somebody to make them five. I don't want people to keep bossing me around. Being a Holocaust survivor, money comes and goes. When you lose one minute of your time, you'll never get it back. And starting a business after you've been through the Holocaust People is nothing. What do you faith. have to fear? The very next day, I was knocking on the doors to a few customers. I rented a truck. Monday, I was in business. My father didn't speak English very well when he first came to the United States. He he had to compete with American companies, with American salespeople, selling American beef. So my father only had a, one thing, his understanding of quality product. So if he couldn't speak to them, he let the meat speak for itself. We at Peter Luger are looking for the top of the USDA prime. He was the only principal that stayed every time I came to buy and watched every single piece that was shown to me he was that specific for all of his product. When I promise to a customer I'll deliver, I deliver. My father was always working, so my mother raised us basically in the house. My brother and I were out in the street playing and we would hear a whistle. That was my father's calling to us. He's home, time to come home for dinner. He worked all these hours, but still had time to be the president of the Bialystoker Center. He had time to take us up to the Catskills. He made time for all of us. My father was a tough guy. He, you know, he didn't let anybody mess with him. He didn't like it. The guy said something about, our, about him being Jewish. And my father got up, no, no conversation, knocked him right out. I'm a kid seeing, you know, this guy knocked out on the floor, you know, I can't wait to tell mommy. Right? And he says, don't tell your mother. Some people from the mob come to approach me. They wanted a piece of the business. I refused it. A week later, two men shows up with, with a suitcase with money. And there was a machete laying on a block. And I grabbed the machete, so they ran away. I mean, I always scared the living daylights out of us. 
So, you know, we never wanted to have that, you know, mom tell dad that we were uh, bad. I was a little kid and I was in public school and this one big kid picked on me and he punched me a couple of times and I ran home crying. Then my father gets into the car and I thought my father was going to get these guys. The guy that hit me lied to my father. He said that I started it and my father came over and slapped me in my face and he said, you lied. A few years ago, I confronted my father. He apologized. I knew that he didn't want to hurt me. What made my father, I guess, strong or made him who he was, was what he went through. I, my father lost his whole family. So this family in, in America that he just started, that he built, he did everything for us so we can excel. When he looked at us, we were an extension of him, and he was always a target. And he made, made it his business when he came to the United States, and he wasn't gonna let that happen anymore. You know, work was the most important thing, and, um, and a family, which is the truth. Look at the hours. My father would be here at 8.30 at night, 8 o'clock at night. They would call the house of the alarm. Order. He'd be the one at 80 some odd years, 85, 86. Eight. He'd be in the car running to the plant, right? And then he would stay here. If the alarm rang off at 6 o'clock, he would sit in his chair and he would fall asleep in his chair. I saw my father cut the tip of his middle finger off. Came back that night and he was back to work. He didn't miss a day. Modern management techniques were not really a part of his playbook, but you know, everyone respected him. There was a certain way about him that, you know, you were motivated just to to live up to his standard. As a boss, Sam was, you know, he was uh, tough. He had his own visions, but as you go along with it, you'll see in the long run, it's, it's for a reason. Sam has his way of doing business. You go with an idea, with a price, with a number, and you come out with a different deal. So you always get caught into his deal. Very strong person, very strong character. He, he don't take no as an answer. Monday morning, when I unload the trailers with Scott, so each piece is like 200, 250 pounds. We're the last ones to do it that way. For me, I mean, I, I do, I unload that trailer and I do all this physical work because I know that in the back of my head, this is what he was doing. He came from nothing, he, he beat all odds to do it. And for that reason, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for him and his heroics. I decided and I knew it, it, w it wasn't really a debate that I was gonna go in and continue what he started and pass it down to my kids. Always had in mind, my sons are going to be in the business with me because without them, I don't think I would grow as fast. With them, with their help, we are growing together. They offered us 75 million for the place. The place is not for sale. It wasn't his business. My father always looked at it as our business. But if I wouldn't have the guts in go, not to go in business, in winning business, in the way I did make it, I want to share it. It isn't the money. The money has no character and no personality. But when he looks at his business, that's where he identifies with his success. He needed this to undo what Hitler did to his family. You know, it was great, it was great, it was great to be with my dad. You know, couldn't. My father was a guy that was very generous to everybody. I wish he was here. I thought my father was gonna live to 120. I don't believe he died. I can't believe it. My father worked till he was 90, till his last days. I cannot believe I'm here talking to you and my father's not here. 
He was that much of a presence? He was like a bulldog. When he sunk his teeth into something, he didn't let it go until it succeeded. Very kind heart, hard worker. I never seen people working like him. I learned from Sam, to be honest, take care of your family. He was a leader. He showed us how to always be in front of the line and then to just acclimate to the back of the line. It's like a sample, you know, for anybody who like to work, he teach you how, how it is. I believe that my father emerged as an entrepreneur is because he was going to show everybody what he could do. Screw the Nazis, that he survived, and he's going to make it no matter what. He came to this country with $10 in his pocket, and it wasn't going to let anybody stop him. You know, when I joined the business, I sat two feet from him. I sat right in between my dad and my grandfather. My back was always to my dad. I talk to my father every day. All the time. As if he's still there. As you see Sam's stories, what you really should take away from it is look what he's accomplished. His fear turned into fearlessness and his abuse became a triumph. When I lost my family, and if my family would be here, they would be very proud of me for becoming a success. They would be in heaven to see what I do. And maybe I'm here to make it up. I represent the six million. This then, my fellow Americans, is why we're in Vietnam. What are our goals in that war-stained land? First, we intend to convince the communists that we cannot be defeated by force of arms or by superior power. When somebody said shortly after I got there, you're going to be a point. I said, what the hell's the point? He said, you go first, you get killed first. I said, what? And I said, why am I, why do you want me to be a point? And he said, well, you're an Indian. I'm one of the unfortunate have the wounds you can't see. A physical wound you can deal with. A mental wound is like a knife, it's always cutting. I wouldn't be here today. I would have probably have drank myself to death. And I thought, well, I'll build a casket. My mother was a, a nurse during World War II. She met my father at Treasure Island in San Francisco. What I know about my father is he was a United States Marine and that's about all. We, we were dirt poor. But you know something? I didn't know it. I'm not sure I would have cared either. I was happy. To go places with my grandmother, my grandparents, my uncles, aunties, go to powwows. And I got to learn from my grandfather different legends and I watched him and I would emulate him the way he would walk, the way he carried himself. My grandfather was uh, the last chief of the Bear River Band and I got to see the respect that he had not only because of his position but I believe the respect that he had as a man. Most importantly I got to remember what he taught me. 
respect others and treat others with dignity. I think he died in 1950 or 1951. And I still miss him today. I was lucky enough to see my own history. My people were the original people on this continent. We enjoyed the single most important word, the freedom of this country, long before it had a constitution. The colonists were met with open arms, and in turn, we were met with genocide. You know, I, I, it saddens me, but I'm proud to be an American. I fought for this country, the land of my forefathers. And I fought for one simple reason, freedom. Yes, Marines all look good, don't they? Top fighting men. When they first joined up, they were just like your high school friends, the guy next door, or you yourself. So we went up to the Federal Center here in uh, Battle Creek, and I volunteered, drafty. There was this big heavy set sergeant, and as guys were coming through, he would say maybe about every 50 guys would go to the Air Force and then maybe one to the Coast Guard and Navy and then be Army, Army, Army. Russ had already gone through. He'd send him to the Marine Corps. Russ is standing over here all by himself. And he said, I bet you five bucks you ain't got enough hair on your butt to go in the Marine Corps. So I got up to this big sergeant and he says, Army, I said, no, sir. I said, what do you mean, no, sir? I said, Marines. He said, you want to go in the Corps? I said, yes, sir. I had no clue what was in store, but I believe me, I found out. These are U.S. soldiers fighting on Vietnam's front lines. They are giving their lives, they are not just giving their advice. To a degree never foreseen by Kennedy, we hold the destiny of Vietnam in our hands, and it holds ours. They open the doors in the aircraft, which the aircraft is nice and cool, you know, and then all of a sudden, that humidity started coming into that aircraft. And that's the first thing you feel. Got off the aircraft, I looked around, and the Chulai was military air base, lots of sand because we were right on the South China Sea. It was gorgeous. My impressions changed when we started doing patrols. We were coming down out of the triple canopy. And at the end of the valley was this little white chapel. You're looking at something that's absolutely beautiful and maybe unbeknownst to you, there's a machine gun behind it. Find out when he opens up. Then everything kicks in. It's almost debilitating. Taste the bile in the back of your throat because you're so, you're so terrified. And I remember the adrenaline, that gut-wrenching though when somebody gets hit, you know. And, He's your brother, and man, you, you feel responsible because you're trying to take care of him. To be moving and you run by a Marine who you knew, who was given the final call, and you can't stop, you can't console, you can't do anything, you just keep moving. It's not your fault, but you say, hey, I feel that it is my fault. We were always short on, on guys, always. My company seemed particularly prone to getting shot up. Donald Maurice Kretzinger, he was from Illinois. He came in in uh, either May or June of 1967. We were on Operation Union 1 or Union 2. Being a combat veteran already, to me, was just a snot-nosed kid. You don't like to get near new guys because you, you've already went through the trauma of losing friends already, you know, and, but we had a good relationship. We were brothers. You know, we genuinely loved each other. And I got to know Donnie's hopes and dreams, you know, his brothers, sisters, you know, and, you know, you live through the families vicariously. When we were walking on, on this rice paddy, and I stepped on a depression, twisted my ankle and went down on my keister. I'd taken the ligaments out of my ankle. They medevaced me out. I was up at uh, Hill 327 at Charlie Med. And all of a sudden you hear this booming voice in the back. Vandergriff. So I hobbled back. I said, what do you need, Top? He said, you're going back to Da Nang. I said, for what? He said, you're going on Gray registration. I said, what? Gray's registration. It took me over to the reefers, which is a giant refrigerator. 
and I was with one of the hospital corpsmen, opened it up. And from the floor to the ceiling were body bags in this reefer. They were all my platoon. And the one thing that struck me when I walked into this reefer was on the back wall on one of the stacks was this bag hanging and it had a toe tag. I kept thinking to myself, what is that? And I got back there to this and I'm down and I look at this bag. There's hamburger in it, more or less. It was Donnie. I've carried that 52 years. And I can't help but think, what a waste. That all those young men, all my brothers, fought for what? Died for what? And you asked me earlier what freedom was. There it is, period. I did a complete tour out over the ocean. You can look, and there's Vietnam. The aircraft was absolutely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I can only imagine what everybody was thinking, but all I could think is I made it. And then I felt guilty. I left them behind. <laughs> I made it physically. Even though I have a purple heart, just a minor thing. I didn't leave unscathed. I'm one of the unfortunate have the wounds you can't see. A physical wound you can deal with. A mental wound is like a knife, it's always cutting never ends. Try to put it in its place where it belongs. For me, I try, I call it Pandora's box. I think throughout the centuries, um, humanity has uh, been aware that war irrevocably changes people. With the Vietnam veterans, there was, you know, a particular continued reaction after the war, and that's when um, mental health professionals kind of identified post-traumatic stress disorder. Hey, Doc. Hi, Bill. How's it going? Good. Welcome. Good. good to see you. You too. Come on in. Hell, at my age, it's good to be seen. <laughs> There's been two issues lately, Bill. One is this Operation Swift. There are times I feel like a dead man walking. Meaning what, that you should have been dead? Yeah, I think so, you know, it's probably, I guess it's part of that, maybe it's part of that survival guilt. So that's kind of what I've been thinking about there, and then all of a sudden, Donnie creeps in. How is it affecting you differently this time? Oh, I woke up the other night screaming. My post-traumatic stress will show itself when I get anxious. I get real short with people. And I can be very aggressive. There'd be days he'd be, he would seem like the happiest man in the world. And then other days he seemed like he hated everyone. He didn't talk a whole lot, but when he did, it was, he was full of anger. He wasn't somebody you handled, he's somebody you survived. Crowds, 
people of different ethnic backgrounds, diesel fuel, fumes, all those kinds of things. At one time in their life, those were cues of an actual threat. Now when they come back, um, they're no longer a threat, but their mind has learned to view them as a threat. It was like a bad picture show, except it never changes. It's always the same. The outcome is always the same. The players are the same. The emotions are the same. In some ways, I think for guys who survive combat, the memories are as raw as the moment it happened. Mental illness is a, is a show of weakness. You know, how can you be a strong man and provide for your family if you're not mentally stable? So you can't admit to mental illness. So they drink to alleviate the symptoms. That self-medication, uh, trying to numb those experiences and getting drunk blocked it out. Jail time and, you know, wrecked cars, you know, loss of license, all that crap. And at the same time, I met, I met Kayla. So I pull up in my big flashy 64 Pontiac Bonneville. This was in 1968. And I'm looking around and she's sitting there. Ooh. <laughs> we started dating. And then uh, I asked her if she'd marry me. She says, yep. And then the kids came. My eldest son, JW, John William, he was born with tautology of Fallot and he had four major heart defects. By the time he was five, he had had two major surgeries, had an open heart to repair it. BJ has trisomy 21. I remember when he was born and he was in the hospital, it was like the nurses didn't want to come around him. It was almost like he was a leper or something, you know. But as far as learning things about life, he's the best teacher I've ever had. My daughter, Sarah, you know, maybe more of a free spirit than maybe she should be. AJ, he went on the apprenticeship. He's now a journeyman iron worker, second generation. And when they're happy, I'm happy and my life is uncomplicated. Kayla, she was kind of that rock of that family. She kept everything moving, kept everything going, but it was still a constant battle with that alcoholism. I know a lot of times he would distance himself from us. It's a very rocky relationship. I remember one time we come home, getting into the refri uh, refrigerator. I asked what he was doing, because he had red eyes, and he told me that he was getting drunk and that he was proud of it. I don't know how Kayla did it. We had many conversations, but her heart was so true to Bill. In fact, her family turned their backs on her when she married Bill. She gave me an ultimatum. She said, it's either me and the kids or the bottle. You make a choice. So I promptly said F you and went out on a three-day drunk. I felt like if I was dead, I probably would have felt better. Went to the bathroom, looked in the mirror. I didn't even know who he was. I didn't have a, who, a clue who this guy I was looking at. Then I realized it was me. So I quit. I think when Bill first uh, entered treatment at the VA here, um, he had just kind of developed his sobriety for the first time. As he did that, recognized that there's a whole lot of stuff underneath this that I need to deal with. You can't live there. If you do, it'll kill you. You know, there are 22 guys and women out of the 22 a day that are killing themselves because they can't live with this. The ones who really hurt are those ones who love the vets and there isn't anything they can do for them. They can't reach out and they can't fix it. They can't take it away. And they can't understand why. And I can't get past that. I think every combat veteran thinks about the only Indian's life one time or another. But to actually do it, those who I'd leave behind wouldn't understand. And I'm not about to let that happen. Kayla stood with me, you know, all the hard times, the good times, all the in-between times. I think a lot, of, a lot of ways that if it hadn't been for her, I guess her foresight, knowing that there was a good man in there somewhere, and having post-traumatic stress, trying to deal with that, not having a real identity, not really 
knowing other than I would say, well, yeah, I'm Indian, not knowing what the hell that really meant. One day, Kayla said, I think it's about time the kids learned about their heritage, and that's where it all started. I think what kept Bill sober was his path in spirituality. I really do. He, um, it saved him. It was a lot of help that I grew up in a traditional household when I was when I was a boy. But that's an old traditional one, that's for sure. I, I think, you know, sometimes we call it blood memory. You know, it's in our DNA. That's where we came from. That's, you know, we're woodland Indians. I do remember going to the Toronto Sky Dome powwow when we were all little, and that was something that really made me want to learn about my heritage. You know, because I was so little and there's, there was like a thousand dancers. You know, I'll never forget that. Going to a jinktamuk means to dance, to gather, and to go every weekend to feel connected, to feel that sense of community. You come rolling in and there's all in brown faces and beautiful smile. The Benoches and the little, little ones running around have your children there, you see them interacting with the other kids or making a lifetime bonds. The dancing, put on that regalio to reconnect with my ancestors because wearing that regalia represents where I came from, represents that ancestry, the dance upon Mother Earth. In the richness of the culture that has been given me that a lot of people don't have any clue who they are, you know. BJ, he knows who he is. I made sure he knows that he's Anishinaabe. He's one of the original people. It brings a sense of pride in who you are. Well, she was dying from stage four breast cancer, mastitized. We went through radiation and chemo, you know, and everything. And I firmly believe the last four months of her life, she had no clue who I was, none. So I told her, this is okay, time to go home, let go. Uh, I'll see you when it's my time. And I said, I love you. Kayla walked on, uh, died from cancer. And then I was kind of just looking for something. So I bought a motorcycle. I belong to a group called the Brotherhood of the Marine Corps Riders. And we have one mandatory ride a year. It's called the Ride for Heroes. And it's in support of the families from Iraq, Afghanistan. You get on the bike and you ride the wind. Um, it wasn't until he finally decided to, to join the Brotherhood of Marine Corps Riders that, that Bill and I became close. I'm not sure how it turned to post-traumatic stress, but we had talked about, about it, you know, the fact of him being a police officer and the things that he had seen. I came out of the Marine Corps with some issues. Those issues were compounded greatly um, by my time in the police force. Um, it was over a year's time frame that Bill and I started talking about PTSD and what it was, but he's made me a better person by realizing what issues I had and how to work with those issues. I'm sitting in, in the living room watching the boob tube, and I thought, well, I'll build a casket. With the caskets, at first I was kind of, I'd have to say, perplexed with what he was doing, because I wasn't sure. And he, and he first told me, he said he was building his own box. When I first found out that Bill was building caskets, I thought, oh man, now what's he going through? 
I talked to Bill, my psychologist at the VA, and I said, I'd like to start a business. He said, sure, why not? And he got a hold of the gal in uh, rehab. He told her what I wanted to do. And she said, do you think this is okay he does this? When Bill first told me he was gonna start building caskets, somehow I wasn't totally surprised. It was kind of like, yeah, okay, that, that fits. I think that, that higher level meaning helps with his PTSD as well. Not only does he get enjoyment and fulfillment from it, you know, I've, helped, I've went with him and we've delivered a couple caskets and the look on the family's face when they see the casket, it's, it's priceless. And he's going beyond the caskets and the urns. I think one of the clients said to him, you're an artist, and he never viewed himself as an artist. This is a business, but I treat it more like a hobby because this is where I can go for the time I'm working that it's just me in that wood. It, it really engrosses him and takes all of his concentration, and so he is focused in the moment on that activity. The Marine Corps trains each individual Marine as a potential leader. Bill was definitely a leader. Bill was looked up to, well-respected. I think the leadership potential carries over and aid is one of the reasons that, that a lot of military, especially Marines, become entrepreneurs. I don't have to worry about the outside world. I don't have to worry about post-traumatic stress. It's just me and that creativity and what that wood is telling me to do. I think the idea of starting something that, uh, that you can create with your own hands, something that is not only useful, but something that says, hey, it came from your soul, it's creative, and it fills a void for certain people. And then have somebody say, this is beautiful. This is a work of art. Good God, it's like I just blew out all the candles on my cake and got my best wish. What the hell, you know, what better, what, what more can you ask for, you know? And it's not about the money. It's not about the money for guys like me. Granted, it helps, but it's the creative process where my mind can go somewhere and keep Pandora sitting in her box. ceremony is a celebration of life. It's a piece of calionite, red or black. It has a stem. You put them together. They're nothing before. But when you put them together, they represent the union of man and woman and the representation of creation. And for us as Native Americans, this is our Bible. For those of us who got an assignment, a little piece of paper said, Fleet Marine Force Westpac. We went, we did our jobs. We were lucky. Even our worst days over there were our best because we, well, we were allowed to, to live, come home, to live the years we've lived, to enjoy the life we've enjoyed. But those young men on that wall, as with us when it's our time, were part of a big brotherhood and as long as there's a Marine Corps, we'll always be alive. If you can dream it, you can do it. But if you want it, you have to work for it. It can't be given to you. You, know, you can be born into anything. You can be born into the poorest person, family in the world. But if you have a dream and you want to get out of there, you have to work at it. That's a triumph. That you were successful to take an idea from an infancy, to bring it into reality, and to watch your baby leave. And not only that, they've handed you the money and you've made a mark somewhere. Life has been a journey. I've known a lot of, a lot of pain. On a personal level, I've had a lot of triumphs. That said, 
It's been well worth the journey. And would I do it again? In a heartbeat. No ifs, ands, or buts. I'd do it again. Even if I knew the outcome, I'd still do it again. And sometimes I think it was my finest hours. Even though the cost was terrible. We're about to begin the discussion part, and I want to first say up front, um, we're going to give a very brief introduction to each person, and in the programs that you have, there is a much more elaborate description of their lives and contributions. So first, on behalf of the blue card, we want to introduce Rabbi Andy Bachman, who's the executive director of the Jewish Community Program Project downtown, and a whole host of other things. Uh, good evening, and it's really uh, a true privilege and honor to be here representing Blue Card and sharing a few words about the vitality and um, essentialness of Blue Card's mission. As many of you surely know, since 1946, 
Blue Card has been providing aid and assistance that has been absolutely essential for the health and the well-being and the material prosperity of survivors of the Shoah. This kind of ongoing work is among the greatest mitzvot that any of us can perform for another, an act of chesed and loving kindness uh, that truly is an endurance for the Jewish people. As you saw from the stories in the film, the stories of both Sam and Bill, these lives are bearing witness to the incredible power of a human life, of individuals to transcend horrific experiences that are beyond description. And as we surely saw in both portrayals of Sam and Bill, can destroy lives in real time and continue to destroy a life even while an individual survives. And so these stories of triumph are particularly important not only for us to learn, but for us to exemplify for future generations that to bear witness to genocide and to death and murder and war and all of the ancillary issues that those experiences provide for us, to survive and to bear witness is among the greatest achievements that any of us can experience. I'm just returned from a week in Ukraine with Blue Card, actually, and we took 15 members of the New York State Assembly, Senate, and City Council, along with the Queensborough president, all non-Jewish public servants, individuals who it was very important for us to convey the lessons of anti-Semitism, the result of what hatred and war can bring, and most significantly, the importance of bearing witness, of standing in places, as you saw, conveyed so beautifully in the film, of standing in places that were places of unspeakable violence, but to testify to the resiliency of human life, one individual at a time. And on a personal note, I was so struck as someone who's stood in the forests of Belarus, of Ukraine, of Lithuania and Poland, and bared witness myself to the Shoah. I was so moved by the examples that Sam, that Bill, represent for us. So then when we leave this auditorium today, we shall be moved to continue to testify so that their lives can continue to be a blessing so that all people from whatever background can enjoy lives of goodness and well-being and justice and peace. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Andy Bachman. That was terrific. And now we'll have the panel come out. And like I said, if you want to learn more about each person, we have in the program uh, descriptions of their backgrounds. So. Now I'll tell you a little bit about each one, brief, as they come. And this is Laurie Sutton, who is a brigadier general and was the highest ranking uh, psychiatrist in the Army. She was also the head of the VA in New York City. Nancy Preston was uh, graduated from West Point as an engineer and a lieutenant and served in Iraq. And she came back and started a business called Milk Money Kitchens, which provides um, resources and facilities for restaurateurs, help them get going. This is, Sam, this is uh, Mark Solaz, Sam's son, who is now the vice president and runs uh, <laughs> Master Purveyors. And I gotta tell you, it's not easy getting the Solaz people brothers and family here because they're keeping the same schedule that Sam did. Meaning, Scott was here, I don't know if he's still here, he said, I gotta be, I gotta be at work before nine o'clock and I gotta go to sleep by four o'clock in the afternoon. But we said it's an important night, come. This is Tova, who you saw so beautifully in, and eloquently in our film. 
and she is a therapist and the youngest survivor of Auschwitz. And if you want to know more about Tova, other than reading what you have, in our website, traumatotriumphfilms.com, there's a section called Behind the Scenes. And there is a riveting number of minutes of Tova giving analysis, but also her story, which is incredible. And this is uh, Eric. Eric Schurenberg, who is the CEO of Mansueto Ventures, which owns Inc. Magazine, Inc. Properties, and also Fast Company Properties. And he was a former uh, executive editor of Inc. and the president. Also a tremendous pedigree. He's going to be our moderator. There'll be cards handed out. And later on, when Eric finishes up with this, we'll be getting cards to Eric, and he'll be asking some of your questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. Can you hear me? Is, is this uh, okay? All right, good. Uh, before we before we start, uh, I'd like to ask you to join me in giving a hand to Harold and Nan, Daniel, for the creation of this wonderful film. That was extraordinary. I was I was really moved, and I'm sure many of you were. I'm here, uh, as Harold said, because of my connection to Inc. And Inc. is a publication that has, for its uh, 45 years, been entirely devoted to helping entrepreneurs succeed. And w what we have believed at the core of our mission at Inc. is that entrepreneurship is an important part of the makeup of our free enterprise economy, that entrepreneurs are the most courageous and most necessary people in an economy. And that, um, and that part of our mission is helping those people succeed for the sake of the economy, but also for their own sake, that there is a nobility in helping people achieve their dreams. What I learned tonight was that entrepreneurship is not only about achieving dreams, but it's also about overcoming nightmares. And we saw that in the example of Bill and Sam, um, and that was an extraordinary, extraordinary message. So let's talk about that, examine some of the things that we saw today with this really amazing distinguished panel. Okay? You with me on that? Yeah. Mark, I'd like to put the question to you, since you were close to your father, uh, who overcame unspeakable nightmares through entrepreneurship. I, I wonder if in your, in growing up, whether his experience, the trauma that he went through, ever became part of the, narr the family narrative. And, and did you ever make a connection between that and the business that he built? Well, growing up, growing up, my father always spoke about the Holocaust. You know, some families and, you know, survivors, you know, they buried it, um, they didn't speak about it, 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 it was shamed, or whatever the, the, the reasons, but my father always would tell us about what, you know, what had happened, what he experienced, what happened with the trains, what happened with the, his family, with his brothers, he always exposed us to it. Um, when we were growing up, my father was, at the time, was very involved with a charity called the Bialystoker Center and Nursing Home for the Aged down on um, Broadway, Lower East Side, 228 Broadway. Um, and he brought us down there also and introduced us to other survivors and people that were all congregated together at the center and they were all survivors sharing in the same type of experiences. So he didn't shelter us from that. Uh, but growing up at, in, in the household, uh, he was very, he encouraged us if we wanted to make money, he just said he didn't ever like threw money or gave us money so easily. He said you have to work for it. So if you wanted to make money, he said go out and shovel snow. So my brother and I would go around the neighborhood during the winter time, and we would be shoveling homes for five dollars and ten dollars, and I mean, exhausting ourselves to the point where we wouldn't come home because we knew my father was leaving at three o'clock in the morning at the time. Um, and as a business crew, he would be going in earlier, but we would see him come home at night, you know, in the day, uh, dark, right? So he would go get to work at when it was dark, and he'd come home when it was dark. So when we had to work and shovel, it was, you know, you went out, and you didn't come back until, 
you know, it was too late when we whistled. So we didn't know of, you know, a simple way of doing it. It was the only way my father showed us. So I guess we were introduced to running a business or being uh, independent. If you wanted something, you had to get it. You couldn't expect to be given it. And that was another thing I think that stands out with my father was that um, there is ways to receive something, and that could be a crutch. If you're always receiving something and leaning on it, and if someone pulls the crutch out, you fall. He didn't want that to happen to us. So he always made sure that we were um, getting it and earning it so we would be independent. Right, and self-sufficient. I, I, the connection is pretty clear there, I, I think. Tovok, let, let's talk about your experience as a survivor. The, uh, one of the things about Sam's story that we just saw was that in addition to being a very skilled business builder, butcher, and skilled at his, his task at also pulling people together to build a business, he was incredibly determined, and he worked incredibly hard. He was driven. Do you see that uh, yeah. from other survivors? Is that part of the makeup? Well, the thing is that many survivors, including myself, felt that they lost a lot of time. And time, what do we have? We only have time on this earth, right? Money comes and goes. If you lose a minute, it's gone. So many survivors feel that they have to make up for it. And, um, and I know I myself is a pretty hard worker, but not the money because I'm a, I'm a therapist, I'm a social worker. It was to use my time for something that will benefit people who are in trouble. Because um, when I was in trouble, I had a lot of help when I came to this country, psychological help. And I've been doing, I'm, I'm still working. <laughs> I, I work, you know, at my age, um, because I can't think what else a person would do with their time unless they want to leave this this place, the earth, better than they found it, and it's certainly for me. So uh, that's what I want to say. Good. Uh, well, uh, clearly, um, there are a lot of lessons to learn from you and your career about drive. Yeah. Let, let's, uh, sw let's move on to the story of Bill. And, um, you know, I found, as I was watching th that, um, and uh, I'll, I'll direct the question to you, Lori. Um, that I wish I knew more about PTSD, its, its manifestations, uh, its, its deep psychological causes, and how it's affecting um, veterans of different wars differently, I including the kind of never-ending wars that we've been involved in since 2001. Could you just give us a, a bit of background as your, uh, from your experience as a psychiatrist? Well, thanks so much, Eric, and it's just a delight to be with my fellow panelists here tonight. Uh, PTSD, it's it's only been named since 1980, and that was a real uh, gift, a sacrifice from the suffering of Vietnam veterans who were so open about their experience and helped us as a nation really mature from where we had been in blaming them for the war. But trauma has been with us as long as war. And of course, we know that trauma is not limited to war, uh, car accidents and assaults and uh, in you know, the Civil War, it was called Soldier's Heart and Nostalgia and World War I, Shell Shock and World War II, Battle Fatigue. And what we have learned over time, you know, in World War II, all we really knew to do was to provide social support, sleep, water, food, uh, and try and keep folks close to their units if possible. But we know now, given these last 25, 30 years, we now know what neuroscience is bringing forward. You know, I went to medical school in the 80s and they told us then that they thought that, you know, the brain, you're born with every brain neuron you're ever going to have. And so there was kind of a doom and gloom when it came to brain rehabilitation, whether it be traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury. We know better now. But I'll tell you, Eric, the challenge now is to move the institutional status quo, to bring forward these new neurobiological interventions that are so effective and that can help 
save the lives, the families, the spirits, the souls of today's Sam's and Bill's. All right, Laurie, thank you for that. And we'll get to those new, uh, new medications or treatments, whatever they are. But I, first I want to ask Nancy. The theme of the movie we just saw was that entrepreneurship can save a tortured soul. Um, entrepreneurship, uh, at the same time, is a really rough way to make a living. I mean, it's much better to collect a paycheck than be responsible for everyone else's paycheck. Um, you are a veteran. Um, you're also an entrepreneur. Tie those two things together for us. Everything you said was absolutely correct. Entrepreneurship is, um, sometimes I feel like I'm in an abusive relationship, not to yeah. make light of that situation, but I feel like some, I give so much love into this and so much care, and sometimes it just gives me nothing back except heartache and fear. Um, first of all, I think that um, Mark, your family, and Sam and Bill, I think they're all national treasures and what they have accomplished, stories like this make me feel like it's possible to do the things that my mother said were, were mine to, for the taking. So I feel like when you tell your story about your father, that you're kind of speaking about my mother. I feel like they're from the same, they're from the same cloth because my mother never expected that anyone would give her anything. Um, but she did believe that because we're in America now, that any opportunity was equal, equally mine, any opportunity. So it was mine to work for if I wanted it. Um, that drives me to be able to take this kind of abuse <laughs> day to day because it, it is far easier to be an employee, to work for a boss and to have someone to blame when things don't necessarily go the right way or when I think that, oh, I could have done that so much better. That is not, that's absolutely not true. And if I could go back to any one of my bosses now and I say, you know, you are incredible. I am so sorry for not appreciating you as much as I should have. Um, but um, Milk Money Kitchens is not only this venture, it's a for-profit, but it's not only a venture for, for capital, it is a venture for social good. And uh, we, as part of our for-profit model is to create um, an ecosystem for food businesses to launch and grow with no capital or very little capital because as we all know now that with Inc. Magazine and other data sources that people of color, women, veterans will not get funding for their venture. So we've created a way that they don't need to. If you want to start a food business, you can come to Milk Money Kitchens, you can pay as you go, and we can help you food a build a business and a brand um, without this need for capital because you're just not gonna get it. So I like this idea that Bill and Sam have that they're just gonna tighten up their bootstraps and they're gonna just do it regardless of sacrifice and the obstacle. And I think those kinds of examples is what makes it, it what inspires me but also makes it easier for me to Go with the the highs and lows of this this roller coaster that I've chosen. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the highs and lows are are tremendous. And uh, yeah. so <laughs> for you, Nancy, and uh, and my compliments. I f feel like you and Inc are in the same business of helping entrepreneurs get their feet out, uh, underneath them and, and go forward. Um, so I've already talked eligently about PTSD, uh, a condition that has only recently been named and was not named um, after World War II. And yet, of all the traumas that, that people go through, it's harder to imagine a more global, massive trauma than the Holocaust. Um, did you see in Sam evidence of anything that looked now, in retrospect, like PTSD? PTSD is remembering something. Mic up, Toga. Oh, sorry. PTSD is remembering something that happened and you bring it back from the past. I have it all the time, by the way. But uh, uh, the challenges that he was talking, you could feel his tears in his eyes when he talked about his family, and yet he went on and, 
and, and, and, and made money and made friends and I'm sure he donated a lot. So it's the challenge of working and functioning in spite of the PTSD and we, it, I feel it, I would say sometimes on a daily basis and I, um, I just go on and go, go to work. I was a director of Jewish Family Service for 25 years go into work and make money and 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 uh because you have to find funds so it's it's i think that's what it is it's a it's recognizing it um and and living with it without it destroying your life what does it feel like is it anger is it shame no, is it rage no 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 I, not to me maybe to some people um it's not an anger, it's certainly not a shame because I didn't do anything. I'll give you a quick example, okay? Uh, for many years, I used to drive past, um, a, 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 in New Jersey, a, an industrial town. And every time I drove, it had these chimneys, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I take, I take the parkway, and I said, oh, the chimneys are coming up. These are just simple chimneys of some company. I had a different chimney in mind. So what I would do is drive quickly by, and when I went to work, I forgot all about it. In other words, it, it doesn't ruin anything, but it has to be there and you really have to accept it because if you don't accept it, it's, it's always bothering you. So I knew what was happening. And I see a lot of things on a daily basis that um, things come up and bring, but it doesn't stop me from functioning and working and making money and whatever, you know. Good, thank you, thank you. Mark, would you like to tackle that question? Uh, you know, my, my, clearly my father would, you know, recall the instance, he, he spoke about the instance all the time. He wanted us to know. And when he would talk about it, obviously he was remembering the instances that he was uh, speaking of. Um, when you saw in the film, you saw that he was he started to tear up when he got hit in the head with the with the rifle. Um, I don't. He wasn't crying and tearing up because he got hit in the head with the rifle. He was tearing up because right after they got hit in the rifle, the guy he couldn't pick up because he was still only 12 years old got shot and killed because he couldn't lift him. So he was. He, that is the guilt of him not being able to do something to save the, the, the gentleman, right? So that was the tearing up. You know, he, my father got shot. He didn't cry. He wasn't tearing up when the, he got shot in the arm or when it grazed him or when he got stabbed. I mean, he never spoke or ever teared up when he spoke about when he was stabbed in the stomach or when he, or when he was um, shot in the knee. He never teared up. Tears up when someone else got affected by his inability to do something about it. The, I think that, um, you know, in, in retrospect, my father, what drove my father was, I guess he lived every day thinking about the trauma as he was growing up. I mean, he mo lived with it as if it was a, um, uh, a, uh, a partner, as if it was, it was with him, not something as he reflected back and had fear of or nightmares. He... Except my father was buying and selling newspapers. You know, he already lost his family. He was an orphan, and he was in the ghetto, and he was going out, and he was selling gold teeth and selling stuff that people would give him and bringing back food and newspapers and, and then ultimately gunpowder, and he was helping with the, um, with the uprising. So he was keeping himself busy, but, um, he, you know, he didn't stay home or go into bed and, and, and put a thumb in his mouth and, you know, some... People would fall down and, and, and it would buckle and we'd hit, their knees would hit the ground and never get up. My father stood up and looked at everything, you know, down in, you know, look at adversity and he just, you know, damn the torpedoes, you know, and he just wor worked with it. His determination really, really came across. One thing that struck me about his story and Bill's was that in addition to entrepreneurship as sort of a saving grace, there was a connection to a heritage. Mm -hmm. Sam's pride in his Jewishness was evident. Uh, and for Bill, it seemed that 
his connection to his Native American heritage also was part of his recovery. Um, is that sense of belonging part of the path out of PTSD, Lori? You know, this notion of identity is so central. I, I think Bill said it when he said, you know, war changes everyone. And you saw the family members, you saw the friends, you saw the, the impact of Bill and Sam both working to, to, to reclaim their identity after war. Who am I now? And you, you know, for example, with Bill, you may have noticed he had a patch on that said spiritual leader, which is not at all unusual. I mean, it becomes a spiritual journey. Mm. You know, for me, Joseph Campbell and his work about the hero's journey helped me come through some mighty dark patches along my way. But it's, it's, it's so important, you know, the Native Americans uh, have s such traditions that have such meaning for cleansing and purification, and they, 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 they know the importance of designating those warriors who are going out to do something that is outside normal human experience, and they, you know, the war paint and all of the rest. I think the Jewish tradition also has such richness and such ritual and such community and communal, and, and as, Rever as Rabbi Andy uh, spoke about earlier, you know, the power of bearing witness. So it really does become a very central task for anyone who's coming out of a highly traumatic experience. Your worldview is completely changed, and then you gotta grapple with, okay, so who am I now? Yeah. Tova? I just wanted to say that I think that's what saved me because since I was only one year old when we went to a ghetto and so forth, at six and a half, when I was liberated in Auschwitz, mm. I knew that Jews have to die, but I didn't know why. Mm. I didn't even know what Judaism was because I never had a chance to go to school or learn about it. Mm. And at that time, my parents <laughs> had so many issues, they couldn't tell me, well, you know, you're being killed or they, because you're Jewish. But what happened is right afterwards, I began to study Judaism. And it, it felt like I was coming home. Mm. It, it, it really helped a lot of healing. And I learned, lived in Israel, and um, my, my family, uh, they're all uh, in some way observant, they're very Jewish. So I think this is a terrific part for healing because without that, I don't think I would be where I am right now. And while we're speaking of community, I, you should have seen the way Laurie and Nancy greeted themselves, uh, each other, uh, in the green room. So there's something about being a veteran too, I think, that is, that is part of a, a, a community, a family. It struck me that that Bill, despite the horrible experiences he went through, um, still wore a marine patch on his uh, on his motorcycle jacket. Nancy, what's what's that about? I'm gonna have to compose myself a bit. Excuse me. <laughs> <coughs> so I grew up. Um, I was born in South Korea. And I was adopted by an American service member, and I believe that I inherited service from him. And he was married to a Korean woman, and I believe I inherited this love and power of cooking from her. And so, um, but when I talk about my, my father, and I talk about our upbringing, this, I was so grateful to come to the United States. Um, I was so grateful to have a family. And um, we grew up with not a lot of money. And so I joined the Army when I was 18 and just hoping to get some college money. I wasn't in love with the Army then. I may still not be in love with it now. But uh, it changed me. There was something. I always thought I was very selfish. I was, I believed that that was just, I was just very self-focused. And I believe it's because we are, we didn't have that much money. I had to always focus on my own problems and help my mother uh, with with uh, raising, you know, just making ends meet. And so when I joined the army, I thought I was one person. And in that nine weeks, it showed me that I was, 
I could be something else, that I could be this person that I've always wanted to be, and that I could be giving, and I could be a team player, um, that I could want things for the greater good and for the greater group that may be painful to me and may be sacrificial to me. And so after nine weeks, I was, I was sold. This is the life I wanted. This is where I wanted to be and I wanted to serve and I didn't know what that capacity would be. And years later, it would take me to you know, get me an education and um, even an all-inclusive trip to Iraq. And so, you know, <laughs> these kinds of experiences, um, they change you forever. They, when Bill said that, it's like, and um, I consider myself very lucky. I consider my husband, who's an army ranger and a veteran of the Iraqi war and the uh, war in Afghanistan, um, I consider him very lucky. And, um, but I see that sometimes the things that we carry from that experience, the good and the bad, you know, it is like a limb. And so um, entrepreneurship actually helped me kind of see those things because I thought I was fine when I came back. I thought I was so lucky and I felt so grateful that I didn't have anything to worry about. And it was years later and it was, you know, being on this ride, this entrepreneurial roller coasters up and down. And then I found out, wow, um, I wasn't until I had seen a doctor in the VA af only after friends of mine had told me, you know what? I've been dealing with depression. I think you should talk to someone. <laughs> and so when really close people to you recognize things in you, then you maybe you need to uh, start addressing it. And so I went in and I got help for the first time, not knowing yet that I needed it. And um, I just thought I was, I just thought I was, I thought my loneliness was just, you know, t fatigue and this, this drain that the, the company was putting on me, but it really was depression. And it helped me when I, when I found there was a solution, I was so relieved. Oh my gosh, I'm depressed. And now I know that you can help me because back in Bill's day that you couldn't talk to people about this that I'm sad, I'm depressed, I'm lonely. You know, um, these are not things that you share because when, you, when people think that, you, they used to think that you're weak. Um, now we find real power in being able to talk about the things that hurt us and uh, we find real um, revelation in finding those solutions. Uh, let me segue off that to, uh, to open up the question that you raised in, in your first remarks, Lori, about new treatments for PTSD. Um, and I, I have to tell you, I actually have a personal connection here. My daughter, a medical researcher, was looking at new treatments for PTSD, which include MDMA. So, but over to you. Yes, so I mentioned the role of neuroscience in helping us understand, not just because it's theoretical, but now we have brain imaging. We can see the brain functioning. We know that the mind-body system under conditions of stress and trauma and duress can get defensive mobilized energy. You know, the fight or flight energy, it gets stuck. And it's in that stuckness that if you don't pay attention to what we now know about neurobiology, you're gonna think, well, a little medication here, and if that doesn't work, maybe another one, and another one, and another one. And you can't talk it away, and you can't medicate it away, which is why the newest and most effective approaches are things like Dr. Elizabeth Stanley and her Mind Fitness Training Institute program. And it's online and it's, it's for first responders and for teachers and for veterans, it's free. And, and, and the research that's been done on that, uh, it's not meditation, it's an attentional practice that helps you rebalance your mind-body system. Mm -hmm. There's a, a modality I'm working with right now, Dr. Frank Bork, who, who, who honed this after 9-11 here in New York. And it's a manualized therapy, reconsolidation of traumatic memory. It's a neurobiological intervention. No medication, three to five hours, and a 90% remission rate of PTS symptoms. 90%. And he has been trying to get it out for 13 years. I'm telling you, the rest of my days on this, on this world 
on this planet, Eric, it's going to get out there, and that's what I'm working on right now. But be, you know, so 90% remission rate, that's amazing. Yes. But then for those, there's still 10% that still need some help. And MDMA, I have been a huge champion of that work because, you know, we ought not be locked into our own sense of what's right or wrong about the party drug or ecstasy or whatever. Suffering is suffering. And the MDA, MDMA research, which has been dubbed by the FDA as a breakthrough therapy, has been subject to the most rigorous standards of science and research. And uh, as one veteran said when he was in one of the early trials, they're in phase three clinical trials now, he said, you know, I had survivor's guilt when I came back from Iraq. And he says, now, he says, I have survivor's guilt again because I've been able to get this therapy and my buddies still can't. So there's a lot of work to do, but yes, there is hope. And we've just got to keep on, keep on pushing. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> Mark, I, I would be remiss if, if I didn't ask you to put an epilogue on the story of your dad. And one of the things that, that I learned from Harold, uh, which didn't make it in, into the film, was about the, the sale of the company. Now, or the non-sale of the company, actually. We saw many times that he refused literal, you know, briefcases full of cash for his company. Uh, and as he was dying, he gave you and your brother the opportunity to say, to sell it, that now it was okay. Um, and yet you haven't. Why not? Well, um, you know, my father... Mike up, Mark. My, fa uh, my father built this business, you know, for us, the family. My brother's in it, I'm in it. Now we have my son, Max, my nephew, uh, Harry. He's in the business. And, you know, we really enjoy working together as a team. We miss my father because he's not there, but we still talk to him, we talk of him and about him, and we have, uh, you know, pictures of him, you know, by his desk. His, st his desk is still there with you. We use it as he used it. You know, we still sit at his desk. We, you know, the, his same notepads that he was writing, those little notes, the notes that he wrote were still there. We use them still. Um, nice. So, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, we don't want to lose a piece of my father if we lose or give up the business. Well, he said, you know, if you get $100 million for the business, you should sell it. And, uh, you know, you know, COVID hit after my father passed away. He passed away in February of 2019. He was coming to work in December of 2018. Uh, he was coming to, during Chris, uh, it was Chris, right before Christmas, and he was coming to hand all the men out their Christmas bonuses, and he couldn't make it up the stairs. So we knew we had a, we said, okay, we're going to take you, you know, have you checked out, take him to the hospital. Because he just he he just lost the ability to move, right? His his he had um, his heart was not pumping enough uh, blood to his legs and back up for him to be able to um, walk. And from that moment, from Christmas 2018, from there he was in the hospital for a couple of weeks and then back in the house. And he passed away on February the 13th, 2019. But and COVID hit basically. Um, it was a year later, right? It was um, February of 2020. So um, we had obviously that, that year that we lost him, that, you know, there was just regrouping and uh, just keeping the business going and dealing with the fact that we just lost him. And during that one year that we lost him, we were also saying Kaddish for my father for 11 months, which is uh, every day we, we had a minion in our plant. Um, and people from all over the market would come and make a minion of 10. So that took us to January of 2020. And in February of 2020, COVID started coming down. So we went from one uh, trauma and experience of it right into now a new one. So all the business basically, half the business disappeared, right, for, for COVID. So, you know, the restaurants and hotels all closed. And so the business basically started disappearing, right? But we, obviously, we were also 
first responders, I guess, we were still supplying supermarkets that had a supply to, you know, the, the, you know, the families that needed to uh, shop because they weren't going to restaurants or, or hotels anymore. So we were supplying to supermarkets. We, re -pivot, we pivoted, um, and restaurants and hotels started, restaurants started to open in September of 2020, right after the summer went over, was over. They started getting back in, you know, the outdoor cafes and, you know, the, the modifications of the city in order to allow restaurants to open. Um, so from, uh, we now basically, hotels started to come back over the summer. A couple of them started to open up again. Some of them are gonna open in 2022. We started seeing some of the light come back on, right? Because some of those institutions are now starting to come back. Uh, our business is actually now back about 80% uh, of where we were in our worst, uh, 2019, our best year. So we're only off of our best year about maybe 7% overall. So just in the one year that we, we've lost 25% of our business, but my, with my son and my nephew and my brother and myself, we were able to go out there and capture new business. Um, we've expanded a little bit. We've actually gone to other um, areas we never went before when my father was you know, with us. Um, just we reinvented ourselves, I guess. Um, so we're you know, on track to keep going. So now we've got this new like invigoration. We feel excited. We feel you know, like my father would feel like you know, when he did a sale. We've, we feel like it's you know, bouncing back. And, you know, 2022, and we, we've got a lot of, you know, promise to it. So, you know, selling is really not in the cards right now. We just want to see where we can take it now to the next level. All right. Well, I, I think Sam would be proud. <laughs> Let's turn to the questions from the audience. Uh, I just got four questions on cards here. I'm going to, Tova, ask you to handle this first one, and then anyone else can jump in. But Tova, here's the first question. How do you think courage plays into moving past trauma and reaching the goals in your life? You know, courage comes with success, I must tell you. Um, I work with a lot of Holocaust survivors who had terrific trauma. Uh, I understand them very well. And one of the things that uh, I try to work on with them as a team almost is uh, to go from helpless, helplessness to hopefulness. And that's where the courage comes in. When I say, look, this happened, that happened. Okay, let's now see what you can do. What power do you have within you to undo something or do it differently? And that's absolutely right. Courage to change and courage, like, you, you know, take, uh, start a business. I'm not in business, so I, 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 you know, that's not my field. It takes courage. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, 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 well, but I did take an agency that had nothing to a very big, a few million dollar agency. So it's not completely, but, uh, but it wasn't my money, right? But what I'm saying is that courage to, to face the unknown is, uh, I always admire all of you who've, who've done all that kind of things. Let me, uh, uh, there's another question, a uh, practical question, and, and Lori, I think I'd, I'd address it to you. I suspect that this, this may have been written by someone who has a family member who's suffering from PTSD. Mm. Um, what advice would you give to someone uh, or someone who loves someone who's suffering from PTSD, what resources are there for them to reach out to? Absolutely, thank you so much for that question. Oftentimes family members really do suffer in silence and often feel helpless to intervene. And so this is a particularly important uh, question. If you're a veteran, um, there's a wonderful program here in the city called Headstrong. It's now in 25 different cities around the country, and you just go online and fill out a simple survey, and they'll contact you within a day, and you are then plugged in to really world-class treatment. But if you're not a veteran, not to worry. There are many other programs here. 
uh, in the city. New York City is blessed with resources. But I think one of the things to get to this question about uh, what can a family member or a loved one do, uh, sometimes a peer-to-peer -peer intervention can be the strongest. And so to find out perhaps there's a support group in the community or you can even check in w with you know, uh, uh, the clinic or the hospital where you get your care and find out uh, if there's someone who has gone through treatment and who would be in a position now who might want to almost be a mentor for someone else. We find that that's very, very helpful. But you know, it's also important for each of us to check our own biases and to really claim the truth that the unseen wounds of war, whether it's the battlefield in Iraq or Vietnam or Europe or the Holocaust or the battlefield of you know, Fifth Avenue at you know, 143rd Street waiting for the life to change, it's, 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 it's real. Treatment works and it's getting better and better all the time. Earlier, sooner is better. And this one is my favorite. Reaching out is an act of real courage and strength. And if you remember nothing else, to, 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 to communicate that to your family member, that really it is an act of true courage and strength. Thank you, Laurie. Nancy, I think you're talking about uh, you're inheriting your love of cooking from your mother sparked some interest in somebody in the audience who asked for you to elaborate a little bit about that, about how you would trace uh, wow. the, your mother's advice to your career. When, um, so this, as every good and actually bad story in Iraq starts, it's like this one night in Iraq. And, um, <laughs> you know, I'm nine months into my deployment and I still had seven months, six months to go, it was a, it was a bonus tour. And um, so I realized it's like three o'clock in the morning, we've been working like 140, under 150 hours um, a week. This is not, this is very common. And um, I didn't think I had that kind of, that kind of thing, whatever that is in me. I never did. That's why before when I thought about food entrepreneurship or a business, um, I thought this is not, not for me. It's too, it's too scary. It's too much work. I just don't have whatever it is that people need. I don't have that. And um, so this one night in Iraq, I said, if I get out of here, if I get out of here, I'm going to do something that I'm passionate about. I'm going to spend the best days of my life and the best years of my life doing this thing. And I knew it had to be something in food because my mom um, when we came to the States, um, it was great. My, my father was a, in the army. My mother was a full-time homemaker and it was me, my brother and her. And, um, but unfortunately my father passed away suddenly, um, in the next couple of years. And so she now had two little kids. She didn't speak English. In fact, she wouldn't speak English for like another, you know, four or five years. And the only thing she knew how to do was cook. And she forced her way into any kitchen that she could. Um, bingo halls, restaurants, you name it, she was doing it. And I remember there were quite a number of years, the hardest years, in fact, when I would, after school, I'd follow her to um, whatever job she was at. And she'd put me in a corner somewhere, feed me, and I'd fall asleep until she was ready to go home. And we did this rinse, watch, and repeat for several years. But we made it. She, she was able to do it. And so... And let me add too that we also did some really embarrassing things like um, uh, make kimchi at like giant, giant vats of kimchi and stuff kimchi jars. And then we'd go sell it in the parking lot of Circle K, which is right around our corner, like around where my friends can see me. And this is in the desert of El Paso, Texas in the 80s. And no one wanted this kimchi. I didn't even want to take it to school with me. And so now I'm selling it in the back of a car um, for the whole world to see. And my mother would really, I mean, I think she would pass out if she saw that, that just everyday Americans are buying kimchi at the Whole Foods. Like, I think she would just have her mind blown. And so, but her hustle and this, this, this thing about with food and this is just a skill set you don't have to go to school for. In fact, most professional cooks and chefs have never been to school for culinary. Their school is like actually just doing. And so I got my 10,000 hours in the kitchen before I even graduated from high school just out of necessity. So I think that it's like such a great vehicle for people to change their lives 
because you don't need a lot of money to to learn about it. And if you can build up the skill just in the, your daily life, then it may really be something that can impact your future and your legacy. And I think about this company and my how hard my mother worked and how successful she was with as little opportunity as she had and she had something like this and how much different her life would be what it would have been and how much greater her legacy might have been as well and so this the um we're now entering into this really this bigger discussion about the disparity of wealth and capital in america um and I really do believe that food businesses can help in that disparity because in the way that we're doing it, and we're just one company that's doing it. We have tons of other food businesses that are really innovative. And it's now we're creating an on-ramp to capital. Like I'm not doing anything special for you, but I'm giving, a, if you wanna be a food entrepreneur, you wanna start a business and actually build generational wealth and build capital for you and your family, then I'm helping you with an on-ramp. Now you have an on-ramp to this highway of capital. And if you can get, get through it and work towards what you want to work towards, if it's food, um, that's, that's what, it, what it brought to me. That's what, how my mother brought it to me. Because if she had this kind of opportunity, what she would have done with it, I, it's just beyond. And that's, that's wonderful, Nancy. And it's a perfect segue to, to this last question. And I think it's appropriate that the last question rest with Mark who's the son of one of the heroes of the film we just watched. Uh, a hero uh, in so many ways, but also a hero as a business builder and, um, and an entrepreneur. The question, and which I'm gonna reword slightly, is um, is entrepreneurship in itself a force for good? Is it a force of empowerment? And how, how did you see that in the life of your father? No, I think it, um, I, I believe it's a force for good. I mean, I look at the, the fact that my father took, um, took all of us on, on the, this ride, right? So we all were part of it. Um, we have, I guess, you know, before he, when he passed away, we had maybe 90 people working for us. And they had, you know, 2.2, .2, an average of 2.2 .2 kids in each family. I mean, so you're dealing with, uh, over 200 people from our business that went home with it, you know, supported their families and had school book bags. And, you know, I'm sure there's, you know, they had other, maybe other income from the spouses in, in that family that was helping. But um, we've been around since 1960, it's 57, 64 years. And there's a lot of families that came, that worked with our business that, that worked for us for over 40 years and retired on our business, right? So, um, I, I, you know, families have made their livings and um, we need to know the children of the families that work for us. Um, I've got people coming to me and they ask me if I can employ, we've employed children of the families that, that were, of fathers and, and mothers that work for us. So it, it's an it's a ongoing um, machine, right? Uh, and we're just really tools of that machine. We're just like kept steering the ship. We're not really, we don't really, really feel responsible. We didn't build the ship. We may be building, you know, adding to it. My father started this ship. He created it, right? Without him starting it, it would be, you'd have nothing, right? But um, with that, I really believe that um, his energy and showing that, you know, if you go for something that, um, you're not given if you're you're you earn it and you work for it and you put all that energy into it you get back and sometimes you get back more than what you put into it right because the more you put into it you start getting a lot more coming back and and it double and triple and i think that if anyone has ideas of let's say entrepreneurship if that energy is that really don't rely on just you know you know, status quo, you know, you, you have a dream, you have an idea, you know, always pursue that and things will come as you pursue those dreams, right? And people will help you, you know, this is, I just got a text this morning, Sunday morning, a text from one of my 
data entry guy is saying he found a laundromat in the Bronx for $50,000. He wants to buy the laundromat, and he wants to ask me how I can help him maybe tap into his 401k or if I'd lend him money. And this is an interest of an employee who wants actually to go and open his own laundromat. What a great idea. And I don't think he would have had that, that interest had he not been working for us for 14 years and saw my dad and worked with us and saw that energy. And I'm like, wow, that's unbelievable. Unbelievable. A laundromat, you know, this is great, you know, to start out from nothing. So. I can't think of a better way to end the thought. What a great, or a better thought to end this on. Would you join me in thanking this amazing panel? Lori, Nancy, Mark, Tova, thank you so much. Wonderful panel, Eric, masterful, everyone special. Um, I want to say just that you'll see, you could see this online, the entire uh, program tonight, also on PBS or the World Channel. There's another episode featuring only women, which is just as striking. And uh, I want to conclude with this, that Bill concluded by saying, we lived a good life. It was a wife life we lived. And each of you have lived also. And one of my heroes, who is Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, has an amazing statement. And, and when I say lived, it means a lot. So he says to be is a blessing and to live is holy. So I want to conclude with that. Thank you all. You're a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.